are secular Jews, and we were always interested in the issue of Israel and the survival of the Jewish people. We went to Israel three times in 1973, in 1984, and 1997. And each time we came away more than, more than ever convinced that the policies of the Israeli government would not produce the peace and, and, and equality that they had promised or that they had dreamed of and hoped for. And therefore, these lectures in the Berkshires were intended to produce a point of view, to expose a point of view, which is not normally or always presented in the mainstream. It's not designed to indoctrinate or to tell you what to think, but simply to appeal to your open minds and have you hear a point of view that is not always easily expressed. In 1973, by the way, we took a year off. Uh, we, we went to Israel specifically because uh, our oldest son was working on a kibbutz in Israel at that time. We are an educational fund tax-deductible organization, and we sponsor lectures not only here, but in New York and elsewhere. Um, I have been associated with the Peace Action Fund of New York State, which is our fiscal sponsor, the Massachusetts Peace Action Education Fund, which is similarly an anti-war, major anti-war, anti-nuke organization, and the Nation Institute. And J Street is also a co-sponsor of today's event. J Street of Western Massachusetts. Okay, enough for me for the moment and that. Let me tell you about the way, the way we're gonna work tonight. Um, the lecture is gonna go from four to five, four to six, and that includes lots of audience participation and questions and answers. The questions and answers will be done in three ways. Number one, our moderator is going to be asking questions on her own, directed at Peter Beinert, and soliciting answers and clarifying those answers on occasion. In addition, on each of your car seats there were cards, and those cards are for you to write in questions that you would like to submit. And those questions will be picked up by ushers when you want to submit them, either now, in advance, or after you hear Beinert speak. Uh, in addition, there will be a floor microphone that will be set up in the center uh, aisle, and people can line up and ask oral questions. With one caveat, 60 seconds is the maximum that any questioner will have, and that rule will be strictly enforced. You see this young man? His, he's got time sheets. <laughs> show them, show them the time sheets. 30 seconds, 15 seconds, time's up. And we have some big muscled men who are prepared to enforce that rule if some area is in the back. Okay. Uh, in addition on the seats, you found a card which has a suggested letter for you to sign and write to the local senator or your senators uh, in which you ask for support for a peace program in the Middle East. If you don't like that sentence or statement, don't sign it. Fill out whatever you would like in the space that appears in the postcard and use your own language and wording. Sign it, hand it in as you leave, and we will put a stamp on it and mail it, I assure you. Um, with regard to book signing, the book signing will take place immediately after the lecture when the reception is taking place on the patio outside. As you exit, you exit right. It goes to the lobby. The book signing will be in the lobby, book sales and signing. And the refreshments and drinks will be on the patio and in the bar in the lobby as well. We also have literature in the back, which I urge that you look at some copies of The Nation magazine, a reprint of an article by the former Knesset speaker in, uh, in, in 
that appeared in the New York Times two, two weeks ago, uh, and we're putting that article, by the way, in the Berkshire Jewish Voice as a paid advertisement in the next issue in September. Uh, our committee, I want to thank very, very much uh, Cole Harrison from Massachusetts Peace Action, Carol Houston from New York Peace Action, Pat Solomon from Monterey here in uh, the Berkshires, Letty Cotton Pogerman from the Berkshires and New York, Kathleen Paradis from New York, Law and, and Connecticut, and most important, I would like to thank Lauren Zink. Lauren Zink is a Pittsfield resident, a young woman who came to us for the first time this year and performed remarkable service for us. She is a member of the congregation Knesset Israel. She spent a year in Israel as a volunteer, and she absolutely was a remarkable contribution to our efforts, and I want to thank her very much. Thank you for the entire community. We have sponsors and contributors, and I want to thank them as well. Uh, that, that, those contributions keep us going year after year, and in particular, we want to thank uh, the Elaine Bernstein Foundation and Saul Schwartz, the Kurz Family Foundation, Dr. Donald and Phoebe Gidden, Carol Houston, Irene Lichtenstein, Pat Solomon and Julio Rodriguez, Donald and Barbara Shack, my family, and what contribution is anonymous. Okay, enough for me. We are privileged tonight to have as our moderator a woman who um, is quite extraordinary in her own right. She, uh, she was a producer for 60 Minutes. She uh, has written a number of books, including one called The Stars of David, discussing 50 outstanding rabbis in the United States. And by the way, I understand it's being produced as a play, opening in Philadelphia, is that yeah. right? And, and after that in Broadway. So um, it's, uh, it's really a, quite a treat. Not only a journalist, but a playwright, a producer, a an outstanding interviewer. Uh, she comes with experience interviewing at the Jewish Community uh, Center in, uh, in uh, New York City and at the 92nd Street Y. So please, join me in welcoming Abigail Boberman. Uh, thank you to Don because he's been uh, a wonderful host. I'm honored to be part of this tradition and obviously a little daunted by a room full of smart Berkshireans. Um, my parents have a house here, and it's, it's just a nice excuse, even though it's a controversial topic, to be here on a beautiful day. One clarification, my book, Stars of David, was about 62 prominent American Jews and their identi Jewish identity. I also have written the Newsweek top rabbis list, so a little confusion there, but there will be no musical about rabbis. Uh, there will be a musical about famous Jews. Let's get to uh, the celebrity or the star of the day, Peter Beiner. Um, he is, I think, well known to you, um, but just to remind you of his credentials, which are more numerous than can be described here in the short time we have. He's the author of The Crisis of Zionism, The Icarus Syndrome, A History of American Hubris, and The Good Fight, Why Liberals and Only Liberals Can Win the War on Terror and Make America Great Again. Former editor of The New Republic, I think he became editor when he was 12. <laughs> Beinart is senior political writer for the Daily Beast and editor of Open Zion, a blog which, if you haven't seen it, really is a must read. It is unusual in that it has both Jewish opinion, Palestinian opinion. It is uh, true to its name, open and educating in every way. A uh, conversation about Israel and it changes every day. Um, that's on the Daily Beast, but if you just search uh, Open Zion, you'll get there. He is Associate Professor of Journalism and Political Science at City University of New York and Senior Fellow at the New American Foundation. He has a BA from Yale University and a Master's in Philosophy, is that correct? In International Relations from University College at Oxford. He's married to a very smart woman with two very cute kids. And the one full disclosure before we throw anything at him, 
um, is that he and I are in a Torah class together. I think it's only fair to mention that. We do study together, and, and that I thought was just journalistically fair that I've seen him besides today. And let's get started, okay? Thank you. Um, it's a privilege to be up here um, with Abby um, and um, to be a guest of the wonderful Paul Rubin family. And uh, it's really an honor to be giving uh, a lecture um, in, uh, in the memory of your wife, Don. Uh, and um, uh, I, I really appreciate that opportunity. I know uh, this is a controversial subject, the relationship between American Jews and Israel. After my book came out, a friend asked me, have there been any angry words, uh, <laughs> personal denunciations, ad hominem attacks? And I said, uh, you mean outside of my own family? Uh, yeah, there have been a few. My wife sent out an email of the kind that spouses sometimes do. She said, you can agree or disagree with Peter's argument, but we're very proud that he wrote a book. So um, she, got, she got an email back. The next day it said, uh, I would never buy that book. Peter's a fraud. He's a threat to the Jewish people. I wouldn't give him a dime. So my wife forwarded on the email and she said, how did that person get on our list? Because he seems very hostile to you. And I said, don't you remember? That's my cousin David. I haven't heard from him in years. <laughs> my mother said that it's a good thing that my grandmother doesn't know how to blog. <laughs> Let me start by explaining why I believe that Israel's creation has been such a blessing for the Jewish people. First, it's been a blessing because we now have what we did not have in the 1940s, when our people were being led to the slaughter, a country whose mission statement is the protection of Jewish life. Some younger American Jews may take that for granted. I don't. I still remember as a child watching a Jewish state send airplanes to pick up the Jews of Ethiopia, one of the poorest and most reviled communities on earth, and return them to the people from whom they'd been separated since the days when the temple stood. Second, Israel has been a blessing because thanks to the Zionist movement, we have a Jewish state as a cultural center for Jews around the world, based upon the revival of Hebrew as a living language, and with all the problems that we have maintaining diaspora Jewish life today, one can only imagine how much harder they would be if we did not have Israel and Hebrew to anchor us. But these inspiring, even perhaps miraculous, accomplishments, I believe, are being put at risk by Israeli settlement of the West Bank and the resulting threat to Israel's character as a democratic Jewish state. Democracy is not the whole of the Zionist dream. Israel is not, should not, in my opinion, be a secular democracy like the United States. It should have, as I argue in my book, a special obligation to the Jewish people. But if democracy is not the entirety of the Zionist dream, it is necessary to the Zionist dream. Theodore Herzl understood this. His, his novel, Antinolant, is largely about an election in a future Jewish state between one candidate whose party includes Arabs and supports the right of Arabs to vote, and another party that wants to restrict the right to vote to Jews alone. And in his novel, Herzl has one of the candidates who believes in democracy tell the people of this imagined Jewish state, quote, you must hold fast to liberality, tolerance, and love of mankind. Only then is Zion truly Zion. Israel's founders understood this. In 1948, three years after the Holocaust, with the stench of Jewish death still hanging over Europe, with Israel in a war for its very survival and fielding a ragtag military composed in significant measure of people with numbers tattooed on their arms. Israel's founders wrote a declaration of independence that promised, quote, complete equality of social and political <coughs> rights to all its inhabitants, irrespective of race, religion, or sex." Unquote. For me, that democratic vision is crucial to the miracle that is the Jewish return to sovereignty in the land of Israel, 
and it's a big part of the reason an Israeli flag hangs in my six-year-old son's room. I should acknowledge, by way of full disclosure, that an Israeli flag does not hang in my four-year-old daughter's room. She's demanded one in pink. <laughs> but that miracle is today imperiled by Israel's control of the West Bank, where in flagrant violation of the principles of Israel's Declaration of Independence, Jews carry identity cards with blue covers. They give them citizenship, the right to vote, the right to due process, and the right to be waived through checkpoints. West Bank Palestinians, by contrast, carry identity cards with green or orange covers that deny them citizenship in any state, deny them the right to vote for the government of any state, and severely restrict their travel. Those cards place them under the jurisdiction of military courts, where evidence is largely secret, where people are often held for months or years without trial, and where, according to a recent investigation by the Israeli newspaper Haaretz, more than 99% of those tried in 2010 were convicted. Between 2005 and 2010, according to the Israeli human rights organization B'Tselem, 835 West Bank Palestinian minors were brought before military courts on charges of stone throwing. One was found innocent. My point is not that Jews should not be able to live alongside Palestinians in the West Bank, the place where, according to Jewish tradition, Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Rebecca, Jacob, Rachel, and Leah were laid to, were laid to rest. Jews should be able to live there, in my opinion, either as equal citizens in land and next to Israel in a peace deal, or as equal citizens in a Palestinian state. The problem is not that Jews live in the West Bank. It's that today the West Bank is, contrary to the vision of Israel's founders, a place where citizenship is ethnically based, where Jews and Palestinians live under a different law. And as David Ben-Gurion warned, if Israel makes permanent its occupation of the West Bank, it will be forced to choose between its Jewish and democratic characters. It will invite Palestinians into a one-state struggle that Israel cannot win because its efforts to maintain itself as a non-democratic Jewish state will make it a pariah in the world. This is what former Israeli Prime Ministers Ehud Barak and Ehud Elmar meant when they both have warned in the last five years of, of the threat of an apartheid future and a South Africa-style struggle for the character of the one state between the Mediterranean Sea and the Jordan River. It's what former Kadima leader Tzipi Livni meant when she warned in her farewell speech to the Knesset earlier this year that, quote, the existence of Israel as a democratic Jewish state is in mortal danger. I want to be very clear. The Palestinians do bear, in my opinion, significant blame for the failure to achieve the two-state solution that would allow Israel to remain a democratic Jewish state. The Palestinians have undermined their cause through the terrorism that I call in my book grotesque and unforgivable. There is a troubling Palestinian tendency to deny the historic connection between the Jewish people and the land of Israel. And as I say in my book, there are real questions about whether Palestinians will make the compromises necessary on the right of refugee return to make a two-state solution possible. But even if I conceded every nasty thing anyone could possibly say about the Palestinians, it is not the Palestinians who are essentially paying Israelis to move into the West Bank. It is this Israeli government that has reversed its predecessor and made much of the West Bank a quote-unquote national priority zone eligible for special government subsidies. It is this Israeli government that in April legalized three West Bank outposts that had been illegal even under Israeli law. It is the finance minister of this Israeli government who recently boasted that government money was helping to build a cultural center in Kiryat Arba in Hebron, one of the most militant settlements in the West Bank, and who boasted that government money had helped to build a cultural center in Ariel, a settlement that stretches 13 miles into the West Bank and which former Israeli foreign minister Shlomo Ben-Ami himself has said, makes the contiguity of a future Palestinian state, quote unquote, very difficult. And recently, the former director of Shin Bet, Israel's internal security service, from this Israeli government, Yuval Disken, said, and I quote, 
Forget all about the stories they're selling you in the media about how we want to talk, but Mahmoud Abbas won't. I'm telling you we're not talking with the Palestinians because this government has no interest in talking with the Palestinians. This government has no interest in resolving anything with the Palestinians, I know from up close. So it's not enough to say that Israel will get a handle on settlement growth when the Palestinians finally decide to live in peace in a two-state solution. Because by supporting settlement growth, you're pushing Palestinians in exactly the direction we don't want them to go. Every time Israel subsidizes more Israelis to move to the West Bank, we make those Palestinian leaders who will reluctantly, I underscore reluctantly, accept Israel's right to exist and who are today cooperating against terrorism, as Israel's own defense officials say Mahmoud Abbas and Salam Fayyad are doing, we make them look like fools. And every time Israel makes it harder to build a viable Palestinian state, we make Hezbollah and Hamas stronger. We don't know whether Palestinians will ultimately make the concessions on the right of refugee return necessary to bring the two-state solution to pass, but we can be darn sure they won't make those concessions if, in return for them, they won't even get a viable, contiguous state of their own. So even if you don't believe that a Palestinian state is possible tomorrow, you have an obligation to try to stop the settlement subsidies that will soon foreclose the possibility of a Palestinian state, ever. A few months ago, one of Israel's foremost experts on the settlements, <coughs> former Ariel Sharon advisor Talia Sasson, said this in an interview, quote, if you continue to build settlements in the West Bank, you are placing the destiny of Israel as the national homeland of the Jewish people in the hands of the Palestinian people, unquote. Because when you destroy the two-state solution, you give Israel's enemies the capacity to do politically what they have been unable to do, thank God, militarily, destroy Israel as a Jewish state. Zionism at its core is about giving Jews control over our own destiny. Settlement growth threatens the core of the Zionist dream because it takes that destiny out of Jewish hands. All of which raises a question for us. Why is the organized American Jewish community so silent? I'll give you the answers that American Jewish leaders offer themselves, and then I'll give an answer of my own. The first answer that American Jewish leaders give is that it is not their place to criticize Israeli policy since American Jews do not live in Israel and thus don't bear the consequences of the policies that we propose. Yet those same American Jewish leaders don't live among the Palestinians either. And yet they criticize Palestinian actions all the time. Nor do American Jewish leaders live in Europe. And yet they constantly criticize European governments, often for their policies towards Israel. And American Jewish leaders did not live in the former Soviet Union, yet they moved heaven and earth when the Soviets were oppressing their Jewish population. And American Jewish leaders did not live in Bosnia, and yet our community was on the forefront of the struggle against the genocide there. And American Jewish leaders don't, don't live in Darfur or in Syria, and yet we speak out about human rights abuses there. In truth, American Jews have a proud history of speaking out morally about things that happen in countries in which we do not live? So why exclude the foreign country Israel about which we care the most? Secondly, American Jewish organizations sometimes claim that they can't criticize Israeli settlement policy because a Palestinian state might imperil Israeli security. As it happens, that position puts them at odds with the vast majority of Israel's former top security officials, since every former head of the Mossad, Israel's external security service, and the Shin Bet, its internal security service, who have publicly spoken in recent years, and every former head of the Israeli military, except one, publicly favors a Palestinian state near the 1967 line. But even if you think those security officials are wrong, and that Israel needs to maintain military control of the West Bank for security reasons, that still doesn't justify paying Israeli civilians to move into the West Bank. After all, if the Arab countries were, God forbid, to invade Israel again, 
Having remote civilian settlements scattered throughout the West Bank would be a security nightmare for the Israeli Defense Forces. So even on their own terms, I believe, the argument that American Jewish organizations offer for their silence doesn't make a lot of sense. The real reason for the silence, I believe, goes deeper. It has to do with the way that American Jewish leaders see the Jewish condition. The only kinds of threats to Israel that American Jewish leaders feel comfortable discussing are threats from outside. For instance, the threat from global anti-Semitism or the threat from Iran. Protecting against those threats is basically their business model. And there are such threats, and I'm glad they talk about them. But they are most comfortable discussing these external threats because doing so fits into the familiar narrative of Jews as a weak, menaced, and reviled people. Indeed, to listen to American Jewish leaders is to believe that fundamentally the Jewish condition has not changed over the last 75 years. In 2009, the Anti-Defamation League's Abe Foxman said that, quote, global anti-Semitism is reaching a peak this year that we haven't seen since the tragic days of World War II. In 2010, Malcolm Holmgren, the powerful executive vice chairman of the Conference of Presidents of Major American Jewish Organizations, gave a speech entitled, Is it 1939? Question mark. Is it 1939? Question mark. At the core of the American Jewish community's unwillingness to confront the internal threats to Israel's democratic character lies the American Jewish community's unwillingness to accept that the Jewish condition has changed. The unwillingness to recognize that today, while we do still face external threats, that today some of our deepest challenges stem not from our weakness, but from our power. Consider the way that American Jew American Jews discuss our holidays. You know, there's a joke that every American Jewish holiday has the same plot. They tried to kill us, we survived, let's eat. <laughs> um, uh, and there's a reason that people laugh at that joke. It's because that's the way we retell the story of our holidays. Ask most American Jews about the holiday of Purim, and they'll say, oh, sure, sure, I know the story of Purim, sure, I remember that. Uh, the, uh, the, the Jews of Persia were threatened by Haman, who wanted to exterminate all the Jews, but Queen Esther and her uncle Mordechai valiantly rose up, and they convinced the Persian king to reverse the decree, and the Jews were saved, and then, well, then that's really the end of the holiday, and then we eat our hamatashen, which are really delicious. Um, but that's not how the book of Esther ends. Uh, the, book of Esther end, the book of Esther does not end with Jewish survival. It ends with the Persian king, Ahasuerus, giving Mordecai the right to take revenge upon Haman's people and Jews killing 75,000 souls. It ends, in other words, not with survival, but with power, with a very troubling act of Jewish power, an act about which our tradition has much to say, yet we don't discuss that. Or consider the way that American Jews discuss the holiday of Hanukkah. We say the Syrian Greeks wouldn't let us practice Judaism, but the Maccabees rose up and defeated them and rededicated the temple and